Welcome to the Tribe of Testimonies. Here you will find conversations with faithful Native American members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, sharing their stories and their love of the Savior. My name is Andrea Hales. I'm Navajo, and I'm glad that you've decided to come and join us today. I am on the line tonight with Bob Adams. I'm so excited for this. Uh, he's, you're super interesting, Bob. I'm so excited about this. Would you please introduce yourself in your tribal way as much as possible? If it's in your language, great. If it's not, that's fine. Not everybody speaks their language, and some languages are dead. Sure. Dishni Yuchat Duwasach. Dishni is my Tlingit name. It uh, was given to me from one of my tribal elders. Um, years ago and um, I am I am Plinkett. Plinkett is a um, tribe that comprises um, Southeast Alaska from Yakutat to Ketchikan. Um, it's one of the bigger tribes um, in, in Southeast Alaska. It um, my my mother is um, is Clinkett. And my dad is Clinkett. Um, my, she's my mom was mainly um, Clinkett, but she does have a little bit of Japanese in her. Um, and um, my dad is almost full Clinkett. He has a little bit of Swedish um, in him, but they're both they're both Clinkett. And my my culture, as far as uh, the Clinkett culture. Um, we, the Clinkets live, live by the ocean. So one of the things that I, I like about our culture is the food. And, um, we have, uh, an abundance of seafood, um, that we, that we like. And one of the things that, um, we, we do traditionally is, is put up, um, food like, Salmon, um, different ways of doing salmon, um, smoking it, um, drying it. Um, we also um, put up, um, catch and put up a halibut. Um, and I'm I'm originally from Yakutat, but I live here in in Juneau. Um, my my family and uh, where my parents are from are from Yakutat, and. Um, Yakutat, um, how you pronounce it in clink, it is Yakutat, but it has, um, the way they pronounce it now is, is Yakutat, but the traditional way is, is, um, Yakutat. And there's a couple of different definitions of Yakutat, um, or Yakutat in that um, the meaning behind it. Um, one of them is uh, is a, a place to park your canoe, and it's um, it's right on it's right on the ocean. It's a very beautiful place, um, and it's one of one of the dis- distinguishing features of Yakutat is are the beaches. Um, it um, you have miles and miles and miles of beaches, and I don't know if you have you have you heard of Yakutat before. I may have heard of it, of it in passing, but not any description of it, no. Okay. Um, they, it's, it's, it was predominantly a fishing village, um, but it has, um, I don't know what it is now, um, and fishing and logging. Um, and one of um, the distinguishing features are the beaches and um, surfing. Of all things, in in Alaska, yeah, in Alaska, <laughs> it's um, they call it the far the far um, North Shore, <laughs> <laughs> and it's it. I mean, surprisingly, you would have top surfers that would go to Yakutat and they would go um, they go surfing there, and um, a lot of them would track storms because they get bigger waves and all that, and that's what they're after, you know. But, um, and they would come in and, and surf. And 
it's it's actually pretty popular um, among the surfers to go to Yakutat and, and surf. Um, I, I've never tried it because um, it became popular after I um, left and left Yakutat. Um, but where my parents originally are from is 75 miles um, uh, south of Yakutat, a, call, a place called Dry Bay. And Dry Bay um, is, in, is important for my mom um, and, and my dad. And in the Clinket culture, um, are you familiar with the Clinket culture? Not very much, no. It's a it's a matriarchal order. So um, whatever your your mom is, um, th there are two clans. There's um, the the raven and the eagle, and those are the primarily the two main clans in the Klinka culture. And then you have a bunch of sub clans out underneath them. So what a, and traditionally you would have a man from the Eagle tribe that would marry someone, a woman from a Raven tribe. And, um, and if your mom is, if your mother is, um, is, is Raven, all of her kids are Raven. And that's, that's how um, the Clinket culture um, is. So for example, I am, I am Raven. That's, that's my main, that's my name, main clan. And then I am um, Pluch Nahari, which is Coho. And I am from the Frog House. Um, Pluch Nahari and, and um, is a sub-clan of the, of the Raven. And then it's broken down even more into the houses. Um, and the importance of that was years ago, um, 150 years ago, uh, one of the important things about the Clinket culture are potlatches. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you're familiar with potlatches or anything. A, a little um, bit, yeah. Yeah. So potlatches are um, for when someone dies within your clan, it's up to the clan to, to bury to bury that person. And it's usually it's usually the opposite tribe that does it. They will they will they will put on the potlatch for that person and then or or the burial. And the potlatch is to pay off the opposite tribe for doing that. And years ago, um, the potlatches um, they were so so like 150 years ago, the only way since Alaska is so vast and Southeast is so vast, the communities are not like close together. They don't have, they didn't have roads back then. Even now it's pretty remote. Do you know, do you know there's no airplanes? I mean, the only way in into Juno, and this Juno's you know, the capital, is, is by boat or air. There are no roads in or out, even, even today. So think about 150 years ago, it was, even, even, it was even more challenging for people to travel. And the only way um, for them to travel is by boat. So when a clan had a potlatch, um, the chief would send out invitations. And they would usually, because, because it, it was so distant and everything, um, they would they would send out invitations to other communities and they would have to go to these other communities and do a personal invite um, like going from Yakutat to Huna or Angoon or Cake. These are small little communities here in Southeast. And when when they would go and do an invite, um, they would go and meet with the with the town, with the clan um, leaders, and um, they would introduce themselves like the way I did, Dishni Yuhat Divasach. And immediately the, the, the tribe leaders from those communities would know who you are just from your name. 
and they would know the status of your clan, whether or not you came from a wealthy clan or, or not so not so wealthy. The clique culture is 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 their society is based off of status. And um, the culture um, in that respect um, is so so is important. The name, the name that you carry was very important. Um, going back to Dry Bay, um, um, there's a couple of um, different um, uh, in the Akita area. The rivers are important. Um, you have the Akita area, then you have Italio River, um, you have um, Akwe, you have Dry Bay, and I think I'm missing a river. But those rivers play important roles. Um, years ago, there was a, um, a great big establishment in the Akwe River, a Clinket establishment. And um, there was a, a house there. There, there, were, there were a lot of different houses there. And one of them was the Frog House, the house that my, my people come from. And um, the reason why it was called a, a, a Frog House is when they were putting in the posts, um, we kind of, we, way back then, they lived in long, similar to long houses. Um, there were big houses, um, and they when they were they, when they were building the foundation of this house, um, they were digging posts, and as they were digging the posts, the tribal leaders they they there were two brothers that were building it. One was Dishni, um, which is the name that I carry, and the other one is Dehawadu. There were two brothers. Um, they came. They came up, up, across a frozen frog. That was um, when they were digging up um, uh, the post. They digging the hole for the for the post. And the the frog was really big. It was, it was, it was huge, and it was frozen. I think it was must have been early springtime. And so they they didn't want to harm it. So they they put it aside. And then later it, it thawed and came back to life and left. So they that's that's why they called it the, the frog house. Okay. That makes <laughs> that's sense. They, yeah. That's where they that's where they got it from. And um that's that's where my family um came from. This is going back two hundred years. And these names are still alive. They're they were given by our tribal leaders um to to keep them alive. And I got one of the names, and my brother got the other name. I have a, I have a, I'm the youngest of eight kids. And um, my, my, um, my brother, that's just a couple of years older than me, he, he got the other name. And uh, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. Um, and um, I, I really like that, that we are able to carry on names like that. And, and it's kind of like the gospel. You know, in the church, where names are important, you know, um, and I think that's probably like that with every culture, you know, um, that names are um, carry an important status, you know. Um, so, Akwe, um, going back to Akwe River, where the people were, were living there. Um, that whole village was wiped out, and um, they, the village, um, they were before they wiped out. They they were going on a war party, or something, or something similar to that. I think, I think that's how the story goes. And on the way back, um, they were they they were traveling by sea. And they had these great big canoes, eighty seventy five foot, eighty but canoes that they would go in. They had like, I don't know, five or six canoes that size and they would travel that way. I think the story goes on the way back, uh, they went into an inlet and rested there. 
Um, and um, there was a mudslide within this inlet and um, which created huge waves and wiped them all out. And they were all, they were all drowned, um, mainly, mainly the men. Um, so Hoover was left over in the Aquay. They moved from the Aquay to the Dry Bay area and, and built the same houses that were in the Aquay in the Dry Bay area. So um, the Frog House now resides in um, Dry Bay. And that's, that's the reason um, for the importance of um, the um, Dry Bay area. My mom was uh, really um, talked a lot about Dry Bay. Um, she was the, one of the, um, she could speak um, Clinket fluently. Um, I don't speak it. Uh, my dad, my dad can't speak it. Um, and so she was able to, to speak it fluently and she, she knew a lot of the history of Dry Bay and um, Aqua and Italio. Um, and my dad knows a lot of history about it too. Um, and she would tell us about it as we were growing up um, to pass on. Because like a lot of Native American cultures, a lot of, none of it's written down, it's oral. It's taught to you from, by your, by your mother or your, or your grandparents, um, the history of your people. Um, the Tlingit language is um, probably one of the harder languages to speak, and they're they're trying to revive it. Um, um, there, there's um, in Geno and also in Yakutat, there was a and they're they're doing Tlingit classes and trying to, uh, and I think they're they're doing quite well with it. It's um, it's making a comeback. So. Um, you were telling me beforehand that your parents joined the church before you were born. Um, I was, so my parents, um, in the Akitat, they, um, in the late sixties, um, missionaries came to Akitat and, um, converted a lot of people. Um, our family was one of the main families that, that was converted over. Um, and I was one when, when, when they were converted. And um, I think both my parents were uh, Presbyterian before that. Um, but they, prior to joining, they drank a lot and they smoked and they hung out in the bars. Um, and when the missionaries, um, came in, they, um, at least from what I was told, they built a relationship of trust with my older brothers through basketball. Oh, yeah. Um, basketball is huge, is big, one of the bigger sports um, here in Alaska and Southeast Alaska. Um, so, and so they would come over and play basketball with my brothers. They were, my older brothers at the time, they were teenagers. So, um, and then they, they started teaching our family. And um, my, my dad was the one that um, they were all listening to, to the lessons. And um, he, he was, the thing that converted him over, I think, was the Book of Mormon. Um, him, he, he, would, he would tell me he, he would be reading the Book of Mormon, and he and he couldn't put it down. And he he was he liked it because it was about the Lamites. You know, the Native Americans here um, in in America. And that's what that's what he liked about it. And he said, How come no one told me about this? <laughs> you know, that, that type of thing. And that was um, that was the thing that really um, converted him. And, but despite that, he, he, he read the book, he was reading the Book of Mormon, he was taking the lessons and they were, 
uh, going through the process of um, doing the last lesson and they're going to come over to our house. And he, according to him, he said, it's a nice religion. I like it all, but I'm not going to, he's going to tell the missionaries he wasn't going to get baptized. Uh-huh. And he wasn't interested. Uh-huh. And, um, and so the missionaries came over and they, um, they were teaching the last lesson and they asked him to, if he wanted to say the prayer, um, the closing prayer. And um, he goes, yeah. And according to him, that's where he was converted. Uh, the spirit came down so strongly with them, um, telling him I, that it's true and all that, that that process of saying the prayer changed him and, and, and told him, yeah, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to join. And uh, the, the church, the Book of Mormon, and everything changes people's lives. And I say that because of the life that they were living before, the type of life they were living before. Um, and he knows that. And that's his, and my mother too. Um, and that, that's their story. And that's, that, that is their conversion. Um, and I, I wouldn't be here where, I'm, where, I'm, where I, I am right now without my dad and my mom converting over and joining the church. Yeah. When were you converted to the church? When? How did you gain your own testimony of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? So um, after my dad joined the church, we um, lived in Yakutat, and then he decided to go to BYU. So, um, and he was pretty old at that point. I mean, I mean, he was in his 40s, I, I would think. And he, he sold everything. And this was in the mid 70s. And um, he, he, he took all of us down and he went to school at BYU, um, got his degree. Um, and then, so we were in Provo for about three years. And then um, after he got his degree, he went, um, got a job with the church actually um, in Seattle, Washington. And we lived in Seattle, Washington for a couple of years and then we decided to move back to Yakutat. By that time I was, um, by the time we moved back, I was going into middle school. And um, Yakutat did not have a church. We did all of our um, um, sacrament meetings in different locations. Some, most of it was done in our, in our house, um, and um, and or in, at certain locations um, that we were allowed to do it. So we didn't have when I was in high school. Yet we did not have um, seminary. Uh, I didn't have that opportunity, um, and. When I was a junior in high school, um, uh, I was pretty, well, through high school, I was pretty involved in sports. I played basketball and I, and I did track. And um, when I was a junior in high school, um, I came down to Juno on a, on a track meet. And, um, and I was at the airport and the district president um, for for Juno because at that time Juno wasn't a stake it was a district. Um, he I saw him at the airport and um, he recognized me and um, he invited me to go to a seminary graduation that was happening that night or the or within the next couple of days and at first I was like no I'm not going to go to that yeah <laughs> yeah I could see Why that. Yeah, it was like, why? Okay. But then I, I decided to. And um, I went to the graduation, and there was a couple of speakers that, um, that I remember. One of them got up and said, basically, his, his, his talk was, uh, Mormons are weird because of our beliefs. 
And I was like, oh, yeah, okay. Hard to argue with that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then the next talk right after that, I remember uh, this the speaker came up and said, Mormons are not weird. We're different. And um, she went on to give her talk and her testimony. And that, that, that um, kind of got me thinking. And um, so I went back to Yakutat and um, I requested um, that they do kind of like, a, well, to, to do seminary my senior year. And, um, and so my sister-in-law did seminary with me. She, she said, oh, yeah, she jumped right on. She goes, yeah, I'll, I'll do seminary. It's kind of like a remote homeschool type seminary, you know. And um, so um, that senior year, they did seminary on the Book of Mormon. And up to that point, I, I might have read it, but like all teenagers, all little kids probably didn't get past the first I, Nephi, I, I having been born of goodly parents, <laughs> you know, the first couple chapters off, you know, that. But that that year, I, I read the Book of Mormon and sincerely read it. And um, that was my conversion. And um, I, uh, I decided I wanted to, I, I felt so much about the Book of Mormon. The spirit was so much in, inside me that I wanted to go and share this. And um, so uh, I ended up serving a, a, a mission and um, all because of that. Um, and I ended up, um, I got called to serve um, to Santiago, Chile. Um, and going from Yakutat, population of 800 people to millions of people, <laughs> Speaking Spanish, <laughs> eating different food <laughs> was a huge adjustment. It was a total culture shock. For sure. And I went in, I went down to the MTC, you know, for two months to and they, they try to prep you, but nothing can prep you. <laughs> I mean <laughs> nothing can prep you for, for what you're about to experience. Um, yeah. Something like that. And one of the things that was difficult for me, like I said, I, I mentioned about food. Um, I, I, I missed uh, my clinket food. I missed the salmon. Um, we eat seal. I, I missed eating seal. <laughs> um, herring eggs, things like that. And my mom, my mom was, a, was a great cook. And um, she would make all of that and all the traditional food that we would eat. Um, and when I was there, my district, were, they were very interested in me because I was from Alaska and I was Native American. And they never encountered anything like that before. And they said, yeah, have, them send, have your mom send down seal. I don't think that would be a good idea. <laughs> So I did, and that stuff, seal, I mean, you have to, I like it, because I grew up with it. But um, that, with the seal meat and the seal oil, is pretty strong stuff. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my missionary companion was from Samoa, and he didn't have a problem. Um, he <laughs> the other ones they looked at is like, uh, I think I'll pass on that. <laughs> maybe, maybe a couple of them tried it, but it was like, uh, no, we'll we'll pass on eating that, you know, because it's it's some pretty potent stuff. Uh, when I was growing up, I I stayed to live with my grand my grandmother for a bit, and she would be cooking sea oil, and it'd stink you out of house and home. Uh -huh. and it, it's it's pretty it's pretty powerful stuff. Uh, like I said, you have you kind of have to grow up with it in order to to like it. And I I like it. Yeah, I, I like it a lot the way my mom cooks it and all that. But yeah. Um, anyway, so I I ended up serving um, you know, Santiago, Chile, um, two years. It, people like to say it was the best two years of my life. 
um, I have to disagree with them. <laughs> it was difficult. It was hard. It was hard for me. Um, the first year was hard. The last year was easier. Um, and um, mainly, mainly it was the culture shock, the language and everything that, that made it difficult. But, um, uh, it was a very, very good two years, so, you know, um, so that's, that's my favorite. Yeah. So when you, when you finished your mission, how did your life progress? Like, um, I know you're, you have a family now, so did you like go to BYU? Did, how, is, is your wife a member of the church as well? Yeah, we um, met in Salt Lake. Uh, I went to UBU. Okay. Which is now, well, it was Utah Valley Community College when I went there. Yeah. Um, that was like 7,000 students there. Uh -huh. I understand it's like what, almost 30,000 or even more now. Yeah. It, it's huge. Yeah. Um, and so... I, we got we got married in Salt Lake, and then shortly after that, um, I got a job offer in Yakutat. Um, I was doing finances, bookkeeping, and um, so I went to work for the tribe in Yakutat and in finance. And then I also have a um, computer background. Um, you interviewed Tom Pittman. Yeah. And... Um, He's he, Tom and I. When I came back after my mission, um, I went back to Yakutat and I was doing my homecoming. And I had him come up, and I I did my homecoming in Spanish, and he interpreted for me. <laughs> that was <laughs> that was the first time we ever met, and right after that, we've been friends ever since. You know? <laughs> That's so and, great. <laughs> and um, so a after. So how I got in, he was doing um, computers in Juno, and he hired me on um, to do computers. He was, he, he was working at UAS, um, University of Alaska Southeast, in their computer department. And I got hired on. He hired me. And that's how I got into computers. Um, and then he moved over to Tlingit and Haida um, tribe. And I followed <laughs> and we all worked in the computers there. And then um, after that, I went back to school. I went, I, I went down to, to Utah, um, met my wife and went, moved back to Yakutat. And by the time I went, moved back to Yakutat, I, I had computer background in, in bookkeeping finance. Um, and so I worked for the tribe for several years and we decided to move to Juneau and um, got a job with the Alaska court system. I'm, I'm doing their computers, their networking. And um, that's, that's where we are right now here in Juneau. And um, that, that's how we came to Juneau. That's awesome. So how many children do you have? Um, I have, I have six kids. Um, two girls and four boys. Um, my oldest daughter, um, she served a mission um, in Denver South. Um, and my second oldest daughter is, um, she's going to school. Um, she has like a year left um, in college. And my oldest son, um, he's, he just graduated high school and he's, he's um, putting in, he's, he's getting prepared to go on a mission. Um, so he hasn't, he hasn't submitted his paperwork. He's still in the beginning stages of that. Um, he turns 18 in, in June. So um, he's um, going through the steps and going through the process of, of, um, of going on a mission right now. That's great. Um, yeah. Busy time. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you told me that you are in a band, and uh, I'd love to hear about that. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, we 
we have a what started out to be a family band. Um, when my kids were growing up, um, they we had them um, early on take um, music lessons. Um, their first introduction was in, was to learn how to play the piano. All of them started out playing the piano at a very young age. Um, so when they turned five, they were like, okay, we'll put you in piano lessons. Is this, and, is this a you thing or a your wife thing or both of you are like, this is something we need in our house is having kids? Oh, no, it was just, it was just something for them to do. Okay. Um, it was, we were both in agreement. Just to, the idea wasn't to start a band or anything. Uh-huh. It was just to take, learn their music, uh-huh. um, have them learn the piano. Um, but from that, when they they learned the piano, and then they some of them learned after that the guitar. And um, but the foundation was the piano. So um, in order to learn the fundamentals of music, the piano is a great place to start to get music theory down and to get the fundamentals of of music. And so they each each of them um, took piano lessons, and then um, a couple of them uh, took both piano and guitar lessons at the same time. At the same time, and my oldest son really gravitated to the guitar. And uh, when when they were um, doing the guitar lessons, I was listening to them and. Um, listening to the teacher, um, and I was like, wow, I like that. I like the guitar. And I never really played it prior to that. And that kind of got me the desire to get in and, and start learning how to play the guitar. And then I told my wife one, <laughs> one night, this person at the table, when I told her, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write a song. And she goes, okay, whatever. <laughs> Good luck with that. So, yeah, good luck with that. So, uh, I uh, on one of my uh, networking trips, I, I traveled um, down to Ketchikan, and on the way back on the flight, I I wrote a song, and it's, it's the first song I ever wrote. Uh-huh. It's called "He Lit Out the Sun," and it's it's actually about our culture. It's about Raven, and it's about Raven letting out the sun. Um, there's a great big story about that um but so i I wrote that i wrote the lyrics down i didn't have any music to it and and then a lot of our songs that we um that we made we we currently have seven songs that are out on um that are like on apple music itunes spotify um we have seven songs that are out there and um, they, they're, um, we go through a distribution when, when we go and release them. It's um, uh, distro kid is how you distribute the songs. And there's like 25, 30 online music distribution stores that they send them off to. Um, but, um, a lot, of, a lot of our songs were made up um, during a jam session. Yeah? Yeah. So, and a lot of them were made up on on, on my acoustic guitar. And I'd be just in there, you know, jamming, just, just, just fooling around. And my son would be in there um, playing along with me, you know, or we'd be making up stuff. And so we were like, oh, that sounds good, you know. Um, and we'd be just sitting there just in a jam session. Um, making up, making up song, songs, and um, the the first song that we released is is um, called "Wrong Side of Heaven," and um, it wasn't the first song that we made, but it's the first one that we actually released out on iTunes and and Spotify. And my son made it up on his guitar when he was only nine. Oh wow. So he, he's very talented. He's a very talented musician. And um, 
but it, it takes years to when you come up with the idea and to develop it into a song and then to actually record it and then to put it out um, to have the rest of the world to hear it. It's a great big process. Um, so he made up he made up the song and then I, I wrote the lyrics. Um, the lyrics came after the song and some it's it's kind of it's it's each song is different. So with this particular song, um, Wrong Side of Heaven, he came up, he came, he, he made up the song on his guitar, and then I came up with the lyrics. And um, and the other song um, that we have that I like is um, I Will Not Let Go. Um, that one, um, also, I think we ended up making up the music prior to me writing the lyrics to it. Um, that the lyrics came to me like six months after, and um, that one came to me um, through. I was reading. I think the lyrics have nothing to do with with the inspiration. I was I was reading. Prince died, and I was reading it online uh, about his life and all that, and and. Um, and for some reason, that triggered me. It has nothing to do with the song that I wrote, <laughs> but it triggered me to to write to write the songs to write the song. And um, and it's interesting like that that how how I um, come up with the lyrics for the song. Sometimes I come up with the lyrics before any any of the music is even written or is made up, or the music's made up first, and then I come up with the lyrics. Um, and the other one, another song that we have is called As the Dragon Falls. Um, that one there is related to Lehi's dream. And um, I did tell you that most of our songs we made up um, through a jam session. This one here was made up differently. Um, I actually was at work and um, I have an app on my phone where you can create music. And I had this chord progression in my head, um, four chords, and I just copied it. I just put it down in this app. And then I came home and I asked one of my daughters, can you do this on the piano? <laughs> you know, four chord progression. And that's, that's where that came from. And I ended up doing the recording of it um, directly from the guitar going into our system and recording in, in Studio One. That's what we use to record our songs. Whereas the other songs, we actually worked it out in a jam session. We, we worked out the intro, the first verse, the pre-chorus, the chorus, second verse, and so on, and then the outro. This, as a dragon's Dragon Falls um, was, I, I did it differently and I don't know why, it just, it just happened to work out that way. But the lyrics came to me <laughs> at church oh, in, cool. a, in, a, in a sacrament meeting. And, um, and once again, uh, this couple was given a talk and um, I can't remember who gave the talk first. It was the husband. It was a husband and wife, but I can't remember which one. But the, the, I do remember what the husband said. He, he he got up and said, "Well, my talk is not going to be as long as my wife." When I was making my talk, all I saw was paper coming out of the printer. <laughs> Just kept on printing and printing and printing. And that's my wife's talk. <laughs> but for some reason, that triggered me to to write the song. Um, or as the dragon dragon falls, um, the the lyrics are um, related to Lehi's dream, and um, so each each song is is um, is different in the way it, in the way that they're made. Um, we have we have a bunch of other songs that we have recorded in our system, but um, yeah, we. They're still 
they're still working them out. Um, and I found out, because we are independent artists, I found out it's one thing to come up with songs, to record them, and to put them into the software, and then upload it to DistroKid and have them distribute it. It's a whole different thing to market them. Um, that's a whole other beast. And um, so marketing is a, is a, is a totally, totally different, um, different aspect of the music industry that I haven't quite figured out. Um, we do have um, the songs that we make are, are classic rock, kind of classic rock genre. Um, we mainly have uh, drums, um, bass, and electric guitar. Um, there are, we do have a couple, I have made a couple songs that are um, were related to our hair, uh, the Clinkett culture. And um, that I haven't released yet, but will be coming out pretty soon, probably within the next year or so. Um, but it's, um, one of them is called The Rock, and it's not, um, it's based off of Raven um, and his, um, his, his, his birth and creation. Um, and we also infused um, some of the uh, native drumming in it. So it has um, a little bit of the native drums that, that we use here, here in Southeast Alaska. Um, um, yeah, so what, that's what do you call it? What do you call your band? Um, Italio. Um, I T A L I O. And it's, um, we named it after a river in Yakutat. There's a river called Italio River. Um, and that, that's where that name, name comes from. I know people think when I, when I say Italio, they think Italian <laughs> because of the pronunciation of, of the word, but um, it's it's a river um, in near Yakutat that, that where we got the name from. Been super fun, Bob. I I actually love how you have just talked about how inspiration has just come in different ways and different forms, and I think that's important for us each to remember because. It's not always good. And even with an individual, it's going to come differently. So I, I think that that's awesome that you've given examples of how you've had inspiration given to you at different times for different reasons. So I do have one final question for you. What does it mean to you to know that you belong to the tribe of Israel? I think it is important, um, especially um, after after learning and, and growing up in the church and um, how the Native Americans um, are interwoven with, with that, um, with the um, tribe of Joseph and the tribe of Israel um, and how, how that is related. How the Book of Mormon came to being and the how important that that book is. Um, I have a I have a great testimony of it of um, of the Book of Mormon. It talks of Christ and um, his dealings with the people here in America. And I think um, I think that is um, all very, very important stuff. It's, it's near to my heart. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate it, Bob. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the, the latest Come Follow Me lesson. Not the one that we're in at the moment, but last week's lesson. It was Alma 5, 6, and 7. And the Alma 5 is the one with the like over 40 questions 
that Alma asks the people of Zarahemla about how that they're how they're doing like a self-evaluation uh like a personal temple recommend interview like a personal standing with god um at our in in church yesterday our sunday school focused on that chapter we didn't even get to six or seven really and uh Part of me wanted to really engage and part of me was just really listening. And at the end, our our instructor, her name is Megan. She's just absolutely wonderful. She's so great. I love her. At the end, she's like, why? So she'd written this formula of, of um, how to increase our testimony on the board of of how to become closer how do we be how do we get closer to god like this formula and it involves faith and it involves uh practice and anyway the formula was less important to me than how she ended the lesson she kept she's like okay now that we've talked about all this why why does it matter why 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 like a bunch of people tried to answer it and she's like okay that's great but but even the why of that and I think even I was a little bit stumped where she was going for a, a minute or two and until she got to the to the point she's like why and somebody said somebody said something like we so we can be with God and she's like okay but why why does it why do we want to be with God and finally somebody said so that we can have joy and she's like that's the why and that got me thinking about that other scripture my work and my glory is to bring my work and glory is to bring to pass immortality and eternal life of man and men are created that they might have joy And I was like, that is the why. Eternal life and immortality is so that we might have joy. Like, eternal joy. And I was like, I love how she, like, led us on this path of introspection and, um, of self-evaluation. But she she brought it back to the why and one of the answers that previously was well so we can be with Jesus and with Heavenly Father but why yeah that's the why so we can have joy so we can have eternal life and immortality and have joy it's so cool right I am just so grateful for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am so grateful for our Savior. I'm so grateful for our Heavenly Father. I'm just so grateful. And being grateful brings me joy. Learning new things brings me joy. Not just happiness, but like it brings me joy. It it makes me want to be better. It makes me want to be a better mother, a better friend, a better disciple. It makes me want to have a closer relationship with Heavenly Father and Jesus. I, I'm i so grateful for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I just wanted to share that. And I hope you have a super wonderful, awesome day. Tribe of Testimonies is not sponsored by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The music is a traditional hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, arranged and performed by Kyle Forsyth. I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear how this podcast is affecting you. And I'm always looking for guests. If you or someone you know would be a great guest, you can reach me at tribeoftestimonies at gmail.com.